Hi everybody, it's Ross over at The Daily Jaws and welcome to a really special video. Today we're joined by Jess Farcox who has written a dissertation about shark narrative and masculinity. Jess, welcome to The Daily Jaws. Thank you very much for having me. Hi everyone. So Jess, obviously this is a really unique topic um, yeah. <laughs> and the topic of masculinity in Jaws, because obviously it's three guys on a boat, has come up, you know, a few times before in some of the blogs and the topics that we've, we've, we've written about in the past, but you've sort of done a real sort of deep dive into this. Um, so I'm really keen to sort of understand sort of exactly what you've, what you've discovered uh, and what your opinions are and looking through Jaws through that sort of that, that particular lens. But before we jump into all of that, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, so I'm a lecturer at the University of Bristol in the Department of English, um, but I didn't do an MA until just now. Um, so I did it as a mature student at Exeter, did the MA Literary Studies and Film. Um, and I switched to the film pathway quite late because I realised that I wanted to write my dissertation on Jaws, um, which I saw first as a tiny child when I was, I think, two or three. So probably the first or second time it was on TV. My mum tells the story of me toddling downstairs when she was on the sofa, heavily pregnant with my brother, watching Jaws by herself, <laughs> and me kind of wandering into the room and saying, oh, what a big fish, mummy, and then going back up to bed. Um, and I think as a small child, I was absolutely obsessed with the documentaries of Jacques Cousteau, um, which I, I have to say I'm still obsessed with. I have all his books. Um, and I think for me, the... The thing that really kind of made it click together in my head was reading Cousteau's book, Splendid Savage, which is just about sharks. And he speaks about them in this, ah, oh, the way he speaks about sharks, it's so different from the way he speaks about any other dangerous animal that he encounters. So the way he speaks about whales and conger eels and octopus, and it, 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 those are all he has a lot of respect for them, but sharks are different for Cousteau. And once I started looking into it, I found actually the way that men speak about sharks, the way that men behave with sharks, um there's just this peculiar savagery to it that you don't have when men are in contact with any other animal even lions it's not the same um there's just this particular challenge that seems to come between men and sharks so what I tried to do was to think about that think about what what that means what's that encounter about what's happening there why is it important um and I think uh a, fi a film like yours is really interesting because the book and the film are so different um, and so one of the things I, another thing I wanted to do in the dissertation was to kind of rehabilitate the thriller as a subject for academic analysis. Academics do not read thrillers, let me tell you. <laughs> and we <laughs> don't write about them very much. They're not sort of, they're not considered a proper subject for academic analysis, which I think is a shame because people actually read them. Um, you know, thrillers are massively successful. They're very popular. And there are, there's an awful lot, without wishing to slag off like my entire sector, I think there is a tendency among academics to write a bunch of, you know, articles and books about some obscure novel that eight people have read and three people understood. And then you write your obscure article, which, again, three people read. Um, and while we do while we're busy doing that, I'm not saying that doesn't have value, but while we're busy doing that, people are actually reading Jaws and Dick Francis and John Grisham. And we're not writing about those books. Mm -hmm. So I think it, also Jaws as a thriller like for what it is, it's not, I'm not going to argue it's a great book, but it's not bad. It's not a bad example of its of its kind. You can rattle through it in a couple of hours. Mm. Um, and it's so different to the film in many ways. Um, but the masculinity is like the whole book is just saturated with masculinity. It's so interesting. Um, mm. And I think the way that the, that the film kind of in some ways corrects that and in other ways leans into it is, is super interesting to me. Um, mm. And I didn't read Jaws until I was a teenager. And I'm a, I remember um, by which time I'd seen it two or three times. And I remember reading it and going, spoilers, Hooper has an affair with Ellen? Really? Yep. Really? You know, Good and time. just being completely shocked by that. Um, it changes the whole story. Mm -hmm. And the shark, again, spoilers, the shark does not explode at the end of the book. <laughs> the, shark, the shark drowns in front of Hooper, like looking into his eyes, it drowns in front of him. Mm. Uh, which is a really different death to like you know oxygen tank gun really really different so again the masculinity of that explosion I think is the symbolism I think is quite clear um mm. but in the book the shark literally just dies of exhaustion um yeah. which I think is is super interesting um so I, I used the work of the feminist scholar bell hooks 
in the presentation. And one of the things that she says about masculinity is that the only state in which men are allowed to be vulnerable with each other is when they are exhausted after physical exertion. And that's one of the things you see in jewels that the men are so they find it so hard to be vulnerable with each other. Yeah. Um, but they can be vulnerable with each other when they are tired mm. after, you know, chasing the shark or exerting themselves or drinking or whatever. That's, well, that, that's OK. The, the moment right at the end of the movie where yeah. Hooper resurfaces yeah. and, and yeah. Brody's just killed the shark. They, you yeah. know, they're both physically exhausted. Yeah. And you you see that final bonding moment. And um, I think it's interesting you highlight that because. Obviously, Hooper asks, you know, where's Quint? And Brody says no. And it's almost like it's a shame that Quint is missing out on this, the probably the most authentic male exactly. moment in, in the movie. Yeah. They finally actually connect with each other. Um, and mm. then you see them paddling back together, you know, um, sort of sharing that that endeavour. Even though they must be absolutely exhausted, they're still like, okay, we have to get back to the... And the music kind of suddenly goes into a major key and it's all like, and then everything was fine. You're like, hang on, there could be other sharks. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still in the middle of the ocean with no yeah. boat. Um, and they've just uh, yeah. they've just super chummed to the ocean with a great white shark so it's probably exactly. going to attract others so exactly. yeah but, but hey the music, we all want a happy the music ending tells us that there are no sharks so it's fine yeah um yeah I, I think that's an extraordinary moment i think it's also extraordinary that the only time they i, I think jaws is about tiredness like i think it's fundamentally about exhaustion and i think one of the things one of the ways we know that is that they only apart from that end moment before that, the only moment where the three of them have bonded is when they're singing, show me the way to go home. I'm tired mm. and I want to go to bed. Um, and that's the closest they come before Quint's death in, in terms of bonding, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, poor dears. I always feel very, very sorry for them. I just kind of want to give them a cuddle and be like, it's okay. You can be vulnerable with each other. It's okay. No one will mind. Um, <laughs> I do think there's something there's something very mid-70s about that, that kind mm. of masculinity, that... that um, that very American um, uh, sort of, it always, it reminds me of the old man in the sea, you know, the, in the Hemingway's old man in the sea, the old man only has two topics of conversation, which are sport and mm. killing fish. That's it. That's all he can talk about. And I think there mm. is something very, very old man in the sea and very Moby Dick actually as well about the way that the three of them are constantly kind of hiding from each other um, because they're scared of looking weak. Mm. I think one of the things that's really fascinating for me, and, and again, it's it, the masculinity and, and, and particularly the hero journey of Brody is, is, is something yeah. we touched on quite a lot. Yeah. I think for me, it's like when I look at that as a guy, I mm. think Brody's kind of stuck in the middle of between the very negative perception of sharks and the hatred for sharks. And some people might say justifiably so because of Quint's experience with the USS Indianapolis, although the sharks weren't acting in a personal vendetta towards his uh his uh crew they were just doing what sharks do yeah and then you've got hooper who's had a very similar experience where his boat is attacked when he's been fishing and off the off the off of cape cod when he was a youngster and he's seen his boat getting taken apart but he's come away with a very different experience and opinion that he becomes fascinated by sharks so you've got this hatred and fascination and or appreciation and then at the end of it you kind of got brody who's almost using the shark as the metaphor generally or pot potentially for for life or attitude um you've kind of got that mixture of yep yeah, okay this can be a very negative experience but also it can be a very positive experience at the same time and you kind of see that mesh into jaws 2 there was a very different version of jaws 2 that was going to explore that side of things with with, with uh, brody a bit more yeah. but you can kind of see that you know brody both appreciates the shark for what it is but also understands yeah. what it can, the threat that it can also yeah. pose and i think um the the other kind of lens and this is kind of segueing a little bit away from what we're talking about but the other way that that, that jaws is kind of seen is it's almost like a um a response to nixon and vietnam um, yeah. because you you say it's all about exhaustion and the, the exhaustion of paranoia i think is yes. potentially there um yeah. in that particularly yeah. at that point uh, because of the timing but um but anyway let's get back to the uh the shark narrative and the masculinity so before we sort of dive even deeper, yeah. explain to us what you think shark narrative is. What do you think that means? So I think shark narrative is any story <laughs> where you have men and shark encounter each other in a violent way. Um, so the dissertation argues that that, that that encounter is analogous to a bullfight because it's very rare that it's one man and one shark. It's usually one shark and then a whole team of people. So mm. like you would have in a bullfight, matadors, picadors, horses, uh, and the men always have weapons as well. 
Mm -hmm. so it's not that, that I've got somewhere downstairs I think I've got an old copy one of the original copies of Jaws that says on the front a duel between one man and one shark and like it's on the front cover it's wow. not a duel because a duel is one person it's two people right it's two men it's equal mm. bullfight is fundamentally not equal it is fundamentally unbalanced mm. right because you've got one animal and then a whole bunch of men who've got weapons and who planned and who are organized um, Ernest Hemingway writes about bullfights in his brilliant nonfiction book, which no one's ever read. It's called Death in the Afternoon, and I recommend it to everybody most heartily. And one of the things he says in Death in the Afternoon is that bulls never go into the ring twice, right, because they learn too quickly. So they're too dangerous. So mm. what we're talking about when we talk about a bullfight is a bunch of men who have planned and got themselves organized and an animal that is completely unprepared for what's about to happen to it. Mm. And what you see in Jaws, and I think one of the reasons that Jaws is so frightening and unsettling is that the shark appears to know what's happening it appears to have a plan it there's a set there are several moments in the book where um Brody says you cannot tell me that thing's a fish like there's 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 no way he knows what he's doing he looks like he knows what he's about and he's mm. really unsettled by that and Quint's just like no 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 no. I think Quint says I think I think if I'm quoting the line correctly Quint says that's just what they look like with their mouths open but Brody remains kind of really like what what is that is it a shark is it a fish it's really messing with my ideas of what a fish is able to do mm. um so i think one of the things that we see in jaws is this kind of dysfunctional team right they're supposed to be working together to kill the animal that's the idea mm. um but they really struggle to do that um and i think one of the things that's so interesting about shark narratives is that you always have this like all the kind of meaningful borders disappear. So the kind of what's land, what's sea, don't know. Um, what does the wh where's the boat? Does the boat have clear boundaries? Not really, because the shark smashes it to bits. Um, do we have a cohesion, a cohesive team of men? Well, often no, not really. They often they really struggle to form a meaningful society. Um, John, the historian John Mack says that ships are societies. He says that he describes them as social entities, but we don't see that in Jaws. What we see is the three of them really struggling to form a cohesive unit. Um, and then really struggling to kill the shark. Like the shark does a much, in many ways, does a much better job of destroying them than they do of destroying it. Right up until that last moment, you know, the boat is sunk, Hooper's missing, Quint's dead, Brody's in the water. Like the shark is is doing a, an excellent job, given that the shark hasn't had the time to prepare and doesn't have any weapons. Um, yeah. And I also think that the shark narratives, I would say, also should include. Um, discussion of the way that we insist on telling sharks what they are so we have this tendency as humans to put loads of kind of what we would say in academic speak semiotic freighting onto the shark so in other words we tell the shark what it is we say it represents the vietcong it represents nixon it represents mm -hmm. social anxiety about gender roles it represents uh, fear of the environment paranoia of various kinds right that's those are all human preoccupations the shark has no idea about any of that sharks do not know who richard nixon was right mm -hmm. Um, and there's an argument about Jaws, which I agree with, which basically says that um, it's not reasonable to put that amount of symbolic weight onto an animal, that it will collapse under its own weight. It can't it can't represent everything. In other words, if it represents everything, then it represents nothing. Mm. Um, and what I argue in the dissertation is that one of the is that uh, just as masculinity is supported by silence, so the toxic masculinity I'm talking about here. Pa patriarchy is supported by silence in that we don't speak about it enough and we don't speak about it well and we men are framed as mysterious but also as not allowed to talk about their emotions all this kind of stuff so there's this conspiracy mm. of silence that supports patriarchy and, and kind of poisonous masculinity that i think is very similar to the way that sharks are physically supported by the water in which they exist the, the salt water physically supports them so that they don't burst which is how come they can get so big and not have a skeleton and i think one of the issues that that we have in in making sharks stand for lots of things is that it's just not sustainable you can't continually point at the same thing and say oh and it's also death and it's also birth and it's also the vagina dentata and it's also a penis and it's also that like, you can't it can't be everything mm -hmm. and and i basically argue that we need to stop doing that and look at sharks for what they actually are which is just animals with big teeth that we find frightening they're not actually evil they're just as you just said, they're just being sharks, right? The sharks mm. that turn up to, at the USS Indianapolis and, and kill all those people, they were just being sharks. They were just like, there's some food in the water. This is amazing. They're not yeah. actually agents of Satan or of the Japanese or Nazis, right? They're just sharks. 
Um, and I think I'm doing a, a giving a conference paper at Haunted Shores in a few weeks. And one of the things it's called Sharks, Lies and Videotape. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is the nonsense idea that sharks are evil because mm. it's just it's just rubbish. Like, how can they be the animals? It doesn't make any sense. It is fascinating that you say this because what it does, it actually echoes a video we recorded probably yeah. a year ago yeah. with a scientist called Brianna who lives, I think she lives in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Brianna. Um, and basically she did a paper, <clears throat> excuse me, she did a paper about sharks in the media right. and how they are consistently per uh, portrayed negatively. Yeah. Even though now, 50 years after Jaws and massive advances in science and technology our ability to monitor and understand these animals has improved so much that it actually disproves a lot of the perception of sharks we actually did another video with a shark scientist who looked at jaws and goes well it's probably a six or a seven out of ten in terms of accuracy however when you look at all of the information and footage and things that have been captured from sharks mm. it's not super uh what's the way it's not super inaccurate it's just very yeah. dramatized very fictionalized yeah. but as you say every sort of sense of evil is now kind of associated with these animals and it's perpetuated because of things like you know as soon as like obviously we're in the uk as soon as a shark appears three miles off the shoreline oh my god jaws terror sensation yeah. and it's just like it's just a fish swimming yeah. into new waters it doesn't really have much of an interest in us at all oh. but as soon as someone does maybe get bitten or you know unfortunately sometimes killed by a shark it becomes global news even though those attacks are maybe 10 yeah. a year yeah. But and because it same, yeah yeah and even though in the same day thousands of people will have been killed by lorries or you know vending yeah. machines falling on them or whatever Heart disease or ca That's cows right. or whatever it is or yeah cancer. Exactly. yeah quite quite yeah yeah i think one of the issues is so one of the things i i apologize <clears> the academic language here one of the things that happens is what we call anthropocentric anthrop i'm going to get this wrong anthropocentric so anthropocentric leaching of signifier to the signified so what that means is we decide what the meaning is and then we impose it on the animal. So for example, the fin, right? We've decided that the fin means shark and shark means death. And what that means is even harmless species are then demonized. So one of the books I write about is a, a, a nonfiction memoir um, called Harpooner Adventure by Gavin Maxwell, who also wrote Ring of Bright Water, extraordinary to read Harpooner Adventure, which is basically about, about a shark fishing, a shark hunting business that he set up after the war. And it's all, blood and gore and it's 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 extra it's an extraordinary book to read in the context of ring of bright water which is a lovely story about an otter um and one of the things that he says in that book and actually in in all of the other books i've read about basking shark hunting businesses is the, the, that the basking sharks are aggressive that they are dangerous uh, that the fins are terrifying and you know now you're as you say from a sort of post jaws perspective you think well yes okay we've learned we've we've been taught that the fin and the music means someone's about to die but this was written in 1953 i think mm. so it's pre well 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 pre jaws pre you know well before the book and the film and it's it's yeah it's this anthropocentric leaching and so what happens is they see the big you know, basking shark fins are obviously huge and black mm. and what they what's hap what happens in that book is they see the enormous fin they go oh it's very very large like a an orca fin, orca's dangerous, and it's the same shape as the shark fin of the dangerous warm water species. Therefore, that's a dangerous animal. Yeah, it's a basking shark. It's a harmless. Yep. Like it hasn't mm. got any teeth. It literally couldn't <laughs> hurt you if it tried. It does not have any teeth. It can't. It's not actually capable of eating anything bigger than you know. Not probably not even that. Like might it, it, it eats plankton for goodness sake. Mm. And then the whole book is just him going, "Oh my god, dangerous animals!" And then there's a point in the book really early on where he literally machine guns a basking shark in the face, oh. and then afterwards says, "Gosh, wasn't I brave?" Um, so I do think you know it's it's very easy to kind of lump all sharks together and go, "The mere presence of a shark means I'm going to get eaten, and it's dangerous, and the shark deserves whatever it gets." Mm. But that kind of narrative, it's incredibly basic. But Zane yeah. Grey wrote something it's an incredibly dumbass thing he basically said every time you kill a shark regardless of species you've saved a human life which you'll recall perhaps and i imagine some of the the um readers and listeners will, will remember this donald trump said something like that rem remarkably similar four, four or five, five years ago i think just either just after his election just before when he kind of went yeah i'm against sharks sharks eat people sharks bad <laughs> and i remember seeing it on tv and kind of going I, I mean, when Zane Grey said that in 1930, whatever, it was stupid then. And it's mm. really stupid now, because like you say, we know so much more about them. We know how to be safe with them now. We know that they don't just appear and immediately start biting people's legs off. Um, 
And I just, I just think there's something very kind of almost childlike about, I'm very immature about the mm. idea that fin equals shark, shark equals death, shark's bad, shark's dangerous, help, yeah. help. There's a Japanese poster for Jaws that just says, um, it says across the top something like, bad shark, bad, bad shark. And I think that kind of simplistic kind of shark there's, the whole thing is just... There's, like, there's a poster... Um, it had it had the right intentions, but to me, it was just so it actually countered what it was trying to do. And it was basically I'll, I'll put it up on the screen so the viewers can see it. So I, hopefully I'll be able to describe it to you well enough. Basically, it was two pictures, one of a shark fin in the water and then the water without the shark fin next to it. And the water, uh, the one with the shark fin in it says horrifying. Mm. And then the one next to it without the shark fin says more horrifying. And I'm like, oh. can you not see the problem with that message? Yeah. And it's like positive intent i understand where you're trying to come from but there's nothing horrifying about seeing a shark fin you know you you know you know particularly if you're not in the water you should be appreciating how beautiful and amazing this creature is but yet we're still signposting people to think negatively of it even when we're trying to help them and i'm just like every time i see it posted i'm like please think about this please think about this message because as we say these creatures are amazing but again the hashtag and spoiler alert jules is not a documentary and, and was never intended to be, right? I mean, you know, never intended to be. That was the ever. thing. Yeah, and I think that's one of the issues with. I think <clears> we <throat> tend to approach feature films in a slightly naive way, um, mm. and then find fault with Martin. God, that's not realistic. Like, it's my dude. It's a feature film. Mm. What, what exactly were you expecting? I read a, 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 in the course of the dissertation, I had to read some some quite extraordinary stuff, and I I remember reading something where someone was basically saying that Sharknado wasn't realistic. I was like, what was? What was your starting point here of going? I accept the premise that sharks might exist in a tornado. Like, what? What did you? Mm. What you came? You came. I'm sorry. You came to that film with the expectation you were going to see something realistic. Like, what? <laughs> what's wrong with your put, brain? Put, put down the crack pipe. Put down yeah, the crack like, pipe. Like, step away from step the away. internet and just and, yeah. yeah. And, and, but and you know, also stop writing your thoughts down. No one needs to read that. <laughs> Do you know what though? It's it, and it's we're in a very unique position at, at the Daily Jaws because we we've, we've become sort of a conduit or, or or at least a hub for the Jaws community in terms of not just talking about Jaws the movie but also sharks, shark news, and things like that. Um, but we get emails from kids and kids' parents basically going, "My kid loves sharks because they've seen Jaws or they yeah. just love shark movies or whatever." How do they become? a shark scientist like what are the right books to read all that kind of stuff and we try and signpost people as well as we could but that was actually something that peter benchley said as well that he found it, it was during um, a bbc documentary called in the teeth of jaws book and the movie are coming into the consciousness of children who weren't born when either the book or the movie was released and they are not horrified by sharks they are fascinated i get a thousand letters a year from children who want to be marine biologists who want to study sharks sharks are cool man for me that's probably the actual true legacy of a movie like Jaws however what's interesting is it's the kids the kids are absolutely fascinating like I was when I first saw it I'm like okay when I first started watching Jaws I would probably skip the boring bits <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know the, the, the bits with the people in it I don't want to hear all the talking um and I just fast forward it to the shark bits I'd be like wow that's incredible and then I try and find some kind of information about sharks and obviously this was back in sort of the 1890s when we didn't even have electricity in those days let alone the internet so I really had to scramble to find information but I just started to love and appreciate these animals more and then obviously as we said before you know we've got cameras everywhere now and we've got some amazing amazing shark experts out there who put themselves in the water with these amazing creatures just so we can get a better appreciation and understanding of them so for me it's even though you know, there's a negative connotation around sharks. I think that the tide is changing, pardon the pun, but the tide is changing. And I think there's a new generation of people watching this movie because we've got grandparents showing Jaws to their grandkids now. And these yeah. kids are going, yeah, it was scary, but tell me more about sharks, yes. which is which is yeah. awesome, which is what you want, you know? Yeah. I think it's so interesting. You show Jaws to, to, to young people and they understand it. it it's it's grown-ups who don't get it. It's grown-ups who mm. come away from it going, goodness me, sharks are dreadful, right? That's it. But kids watch it and go, wow, did you see the shark bite the boat in half? Did you see that? Yeah. Like that, that was my reaction watching it as like a, a two or three year old it was like wow big fish don't care about the people like you know not at all interested in whether Robert Shaw is going to get his legs bitten off or not just like wow look at the shark <laughs> coming yeah and I, and I think that's I think that's partly just I think people there's an awful lot of nonsense talked now as there was in the mid 70s when Jaws came out about kind of what in the 70s was called juvenile delinquency right this idea that young people are not okay young people are mm. fine they are incredibly no. sane they are incredibly well um 
organized and I think also just much more healthy mentally than than I think I certainly was when I was 18 or 19 they seem to be much more clued up and I think they approach particularly films in a much saner more adult way Mm. um, than than perhaps our generation did I think part of that and Jaws obviously being a prime example of that is that the marketing of Jaws was unlike anything any other movie had kind of ever seen before now they really went all in on it and the key message was fear shark terror It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. And that kind of set the precedent. So you go into the movie with that kind of pretext. However, obviously now with the reflection of time and knowledge and things, we know that, okay, they were selling a movie, they were selling a product. The truth is very different. So I think now with the younger generation, as you say, they're much more clued up. They have a very... um, uh, what's the perspective, word? I think. Yeah, perspective and better expectations. They know yeah. that it's going to be a sharp movie. They know they're going there for the thrill of the ride. They're not going there for an education. It's not a lecture. It's a movie. It's a piece of entertainment. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the people that the younger people that are seeing Jaws now for the first time um, are probably quite hopefully swept up in the story and the characters and everything else. And the shark is yeah. almost incidental. But they yeah. come away realizing, oh, actually, you know what? It's not really about a shark at all. It's about these journeys of these these the characters, of the particularly Brody. Yeah, and you, um, the shark has no character <clears throat> development, right? The shark's just the shark. It doesn't, you know, it, it has no. It's not sort of ascribed any real motivations. I don't think anything mm. was. That would be ludicrous. But but you're right. The three men, they go on a journey. They go somewhere. That's it. Well, let's um, let's talk about the the three characters or the three main characters in in Jaws. Let's talk about them from the uh, the masculinity point of view. Because obviously, you've got three very different characters. Yeah. You've got yeah. Quint, who is you know, for want of better purpose, of the old man of the sea with a yeah. really harrowing story and and motivation to, to hate the sharks. You've got Hooper, who is, as we say, had that experience already. He's gone in a very different direction. He's really appreciative of these sharks. He thinks they're incredible creatures, and he wants to learn more about them. And then you kind of got Brody, who's for want of a better word, he's a fish out of water. He doesn't yeah. even want to be anywhere near the water in the environment that these creatures live in. Yet he's got this insurmountable problem that he has to ultimately deal with because yeah. people are looking to him to do it. So they've all got three very unique perspectives on the same problem and they've all got, you know, different journeys. So um, pick a character. Which one would you like to sort of walk us through first? Oh, let's start with Quint. Um, Go for it. Tell us about Quint. I think Quint's fascinating. So Quint, there's a, there's a, for me, there's a really clear line from Captain Ahab and Moby Dick through Captain Nemo um, in 20,000 Leagues and in The Mysterious Island. People forget that he's also in The Mysterious Island. The Old Man in the Sea, the captain of the ship in a, a brilliant Norwegian novel called The Sharks by Jens Bjørneboe. You should all buy it and read it. It's incredible. And then Quint. Um, so The Sharks, this, this Norwegian novel, came out in 1974, the same year as Jaws. But because, it was only, because it's only been available in English for the last uh, eight or nine years, basically no one's read it. But please buy it in English. It's amazing. That, that that character, that those iterations of that character, they are very, very similar. Middle-aged, white, damaged, um, alone on the ocean, captain of their ship, not all of them, but most of them captain of their ship, controlling their environment through through having that that their own kind of very discreet little sort of floating home. Mm-hmm. Um, Quint's fascinating, I think particularly because of the Indianapolis thing. Um, and I think one of the things that Quint is being used to do in the film is to attach us to reality, right? Because obviously the Indianapolis, that was a real event. And Jaws is a fantasy, but we it is tethered to reality by that, I think, incredible speech. Um yeah, it's not bad, is it? It's just, it's it it's that's proper acting, that is. Um, yeah. it's so beautifully done. And I think, I think one of the things that's so brilliant about it actually is the way that is the way that Robert Shaw smiles through so much of it. Um, mm. He, it's the first time in the film we see him being gentle. Um, but I think from a masculinity point of view, it's fascinating because he's he's angry, but his rage is directed at the sharks. Yeah. It's not directed at, for example, the US Navy, who didn't go out to rescue anybody because the, because the mission was supposedly secret, so they didn't know what to do when the ship mm. was stressed. He's not angry at the Japanese for torpedoing the ship. He's mm. angry at the sharks. When all the sharks have done up have done is to turn up and enjoy a free meal. Mm. And that's how his rage is directed it's very simple and it's very sort of blunt and it's just directed at, at the animals mm. um, and I think that that's interesting in and of itself the sort of lack of nuance there I think is interesting um, and again in the book that doesn't happen in the book there's no mention of the Indianapolis not at all no. that's all well, the, been yeah you're right the basically I think you know at some point basically they needed a reason for Quint to hate sharks yes. so much and they 
and Howard Sackler, one of the uncredited writers on Jaws, sort of had this story he'd read about it, yeah. positioned, uh, sort of suggested it to Steven Spielberg. And then the myth is the myth. You know, 800 people wrote this USS Indianapolis speech or whatever. But as yeah. far as the story is, goes that we know is a lot of people were involved, but Robert Shaw basically, because he was performing it, condensed it down and performed it beautifully. Yeah. And the thing that I really liked that you mentioned there was the fact that Quint smiles through this. Because one of the yeah. things that I was thinking about, his journey is almost the opposite of Brody, and we'll come yes. on to Brody, but basically, Quint is quite hard at the beginning. He's very stern, very inaccessible, keeps everybody at a distance. Yeah. And then, obviously, through just spending time with these guys on the boat, because this is probably the first time he's been around new people for a long mm. time. Um, and he gets to a point where, okay, he's had a little bit to drink, but they're in high spirits. And he tells this some incredible story, a very personal story. That's possibly the first and maybe the last time he's ever told that story to anybody. Certainly. particularly around people that he's just met and you see the hard link turning to a soft mm. towards the end and you really feel for quint when he does get killed spoilers Certainly. um which is why it has that extra impact but then you look at brody's journey and it's actually the opposite brody's very soft at the beginning and yes. he has to get tougher and harder as as the story goes on because that's just who he has to be i mean one of my favorite things and we i could talk for days about this and i'm trying to put together a blog that i've been writing now for about three years <laughs> but basically jaws i think the reason why i think jaws and particularly spielberg's movies in, in particular they always seem to boil down to the same question it's who do you want to be you want to be yeah who do you want to be and what choices are you going to make what how brave are you going to be to be the person you know you should be or you can be and brody at the beginning is this sponge he's a flannel he's just you know do whatever you want with him he's this big floppy thing whatever and then all of a sudden towards the end it's like he goes back and he's a diff he's a changed guy yeah. and he's got the benefit of both quint and hooper's influence on that and the shark has been the um the challenge that's allowed him to bring those three things together and to overcome and you see that in jaws 2 you can see yeah. him just he's a, he's a he's a different guy if you look at brody at the beginning of jaws 2 and jaws they're two very different characters but anyway we'll come on to brody a bit more <laughs> Um, okay, so think, sorry, go on. No, no, sorry, no, 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 go on, carry on. All I was going to say is that one of the things, the things I think is really <clears> interesting <throat> about Quint when he first appears in the film is that one of the first things he says is, You all know me. And they don't know him at all. Like you say, he's really inaccessible. He just kind of sits there chewing, having, mm. has, so having scraped his nails on the blackboard. He then says, You all know me. And you think, Well, actually, no, we don't. We know nothing about you. That's his default position. I'll let yeah. you see what I want you to see. You'll know me in the way that I want you to know me. And yeah. then that's why when that speech happens at, at, at the end, you're just like, wow, this guy is so different. And when you go back and watch Jaws again and you pay particular attention to Quint, you're like, wow, actually, this character is really, really hurting. Yeah. Even though he he professes to be the, the biggest, machoist, most yeah. masculine man on the island and he's the only one that can solve this problem. It's like you're hurting probably more than anybody else right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that scene where he pretends to be motivated by money and says, you know, I'll kill it for $10,000 and all that stuff, I think... I think when you see it the first time, maybe you believe that. But I think the second time mm -hmm. you think you, you do it for 50p. Like you don't care about the money. The money's not important. You just need to kill something to make yeah. yourself feel better. That's it. It's like the classic iceberg picture, isn't it? Where you see the, just the tip above the ocean, but then there's actually a whole heap of iceberg beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about, and again, I can't believe the Academy, please. Can we just go back and retrospectively give this guy an Oscar, please? Um, which is why, but you know, it frustrates me when the acting in Jaws is so often overlooked. Everyone talks about the technical craft, you know, the editing, the music, the direction, the writing, but the the, the acting in it is acting. absolutely incredible. And it's Robert Shaw who's just... Robert Shaw. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's just ridiculous. It, it, but it that's cry. That that speech makes me cry. <clears throat> and actually, I I had to rewatch. I didn't want to rewatch the whole film too many times while I was writing because I just thought I'll just see things I don't have space to talk about. Mm. But I did rewatch the end where he's killed because I the, the dissertation speaks specifically about various kind of kinds of death, and I wanted to talk mm. about that moment. And like you say, one of the reasons that we find that death so appalling is that it's the only one we actually see. Mm. The others are all kind of hidden from yeah, us yeah or just glimpses and just glimpses yeah. but that that quint's death we see it and we see his like the camera is tight in on his face yeah. and um the camera is also really low down so you see sort of his point of view the water like you see it almost as if you're as if the camera's on deck at certain yeah. points and that, i think that's one of the reasons it's so terrifying but also you see how scared he is you see how much pain he's in and oh. it's the first time you've really seen him express his rage and pain um and I think that's one of the reasons it's so upsetting is that you've just got to know him, like you've just yeah. started to bond with this character and then he's taken away. And I think it's also that you think, well, hang on, if Brody's left on his own, like can, like you say, can Brody do it? Can Brody get this job done? Like, does he exactly. know? 
had a kill the shot like Hooper we assume at that point is gone as soon as Quint is kind of and I think it's I think it's particularly interesting that you see Quint kind of go limp and then the shark drags him off so you yeah. know that he's dead it's not that the shark takes him under and we assume he's eaten you actually see him die and then yeah. the shark's like ha ha this is mine now and then you get to see Brody going what the hell am I going to do how am I going to mm-hmm. what what the hell am I going to do? I'm alone. I know nothing. The boat's sinking. I, 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 I'm absolutely screwed. And I think that mm. that's the moment I think actually where Roy Scheider's acting. You suddenly see Roy Scheider like switch on, and that's kind of wonderful sort of handbag of a face that he has. That it, he's so expressive with it. But I think mm. for me, I think he's most expressive when he's by himself. Mm. When the others are there, I think Robert Shaw just steals the show. But when it's Roy Scheider on his on his own, you think, yeah, actually, he he can do it too. Like he knows that this is a very well cast, very well thought out film, in the sense that he can kind of you could visibly almost see him pull himself together and go, right, what am I going to do? I'm really, I'm really stuck. I've got no time. And then as he's doing that, the shark is back. And you're like, he has it. He's had no time. Yeah. So say, I think the film's about exhaustion because nobody gets any rest. There's mm-hmm. no point where you as the audience or any of the characters get the time to actually kind of go, right, let's just stop and think about this. What are we actually going to do? Let's sleep on it. Let's think about it. Let's get some rest. Let's actually plan. And there's no time to do any of that. It's just like, no, nope, shark's back. You have to get on with it. There's no time for you to sleep or rest or anything. You are, I know you're tired, but yeah. the shark doesn't care. And, and that's... sharks don't sleep, I think that's part of it too, is that you're being, you're being asked to remember. Sharks don't sleep, so therefore you can't either. Yeah, well, you know what? God, you've... Just in those moments, you've just made me think about Jaws in a couple of new ways or a couple of things that I hadn't actually put together. And I'm probably saying things that haven't or that have already been said somewhere on some podcast or somewhere else. So, <laughs> but, but I've just thought about it now. But just thinking back to the scars scene. Yeah. They're very happy and proud to show off their physical scars. Yeah. Very proud and happy. Mm. But those scars have healed and they've got a heroic story to tell around them. But it's the actual scars in here and in yeah. here that we hide, that yeah. we struggle to share. And that's what I think makes Quint's um, thing even more poignant because that, that he's, opening up a, he's opening up a scar. Yeah. Um, but the other thing as well that's interesting and something that we talked about just before we started to press record was obviously during that moment, Brody looks down and he's got an, what, what, we, what we assume is an appendix scar because yeah. he's looking for something to try and like, how do I enter this manly yeah, masculine world? Because I don't have any scars. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like the best I've got is an appendix scar. So he decides not to, mm-hmm. which I think is really interesting because by the end of it, <clears throat> like they, like you say with Roy Scheider, when it's just him versus the shark or Brody versus the shark, yeah. Yeah. people always say that, you know, you are who you really are when, when no one else is watching. Yes. No one else is watching Brody right now. So he has to be the guy that he has to be in that yeah, moment absolutely. and that's who he takes back to the island which i find fascinating and yeah. i bet ellen had a good night that night yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah well, forget, forget well, so, so brilliantly in the book the book finishes before that any of that happens so the book mm. finishes the shark dies in like the last <laughs> two paragraphs i think mm. of the book and then it finishes just kind of saying and then Brody swam back to amity so we don't actually know if he made it there's nope. no, it's not clear. Like in the film, I think it's it's pretty clear that that's mm. what happens. The music tells you that. They've got Hooper with him. You sort, you you just about see them kind of stagger. Just up sort of make up, make up the beach. Just, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But in the book, that's not, in the book, that's not what happens. In the book, the shark dies right in front of him, like a couple of feet from his face, and mm. then sinks down with Quint, trailing Quint behind it. And then he has to just kind of go, well, I guess I've got to swim goodness knows how many miles back and so i think there is something about the 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 the, the, the get the way that the two things the two narratives end i think is is super interesting my favorite just going back to what you're saying about the scar sharing scene one of my favorite things in that in that scene is is the costume um because you've got quint and brody dressed in some ways quite similarly right you've got this kind of they've got this kind of um i think i can't really tell if it's cambric or if it's denim but they they are kind of dressed similarly and they don't they come scruffy and they're not shaved and then mm-hmm. you've got Brody clean shaven and in that kind of black roll neck thing mm-hmm. and he there's a there are a couple of moments where he looks so different from them and so isolated from them and it's almost as if he is almost as if he's he's the the black turtleneck I think he almost fades into the background in it um mm-hmm. he's just not dressed for the occasion he doesn't belong there it's not he's not linked to them he doesn't know what he's doing mm-hmm. um and i think it, it's it's such a clever like particularly when his glasses come off i think that's another point where you just go you are not supposed to be on a boat you do mm-hmm. not belong here you are so out of your comfort zone 
Mm-hmm. You're in a lot of danger. Um, and I think that scar sharing scene is the first time it's really made explicit that he's just super uncomfortable. He doesn't he doesn't belong there at all. Like he's absolutely right that he doesn't belong in the sea. Um, There's it's interesting you mentioned about the, the 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 clothing because one of the things and again this is part of a blog that I've been writing and just trying to map out in my mind. But basically, when you see Brody get onto the boat, or even before he steps onto the boat, he's got his waterproofs on, he's got his yeah. Wellingtons, his, his yeah. wife's basically wife's like right sending there. him off on a school trip. Like like a school trip. Exactly you got glasses trip. in your black socks and all sort of stuff. Yeah. And then we cut to the boat and he's chumming and he's got the look, he's got the worst job on the boat. He's you know, yeah. he's chumming this horrible shit. Um, he's got his shirt on, he's got his glasses on, he's got this suntan stuff on, he's got a towel with the old spice trying to cover up the smell. But you see him gradually strip away those layers, those physical costume layers to the end where he's literally just in his jeans and his turtleneck. He looks like Action Man, that's what he he looks looks like. He looks like Bruce Willis, I think. You know, when you see Bruce Willis in the films that came after that, you're like, oh, okay, I I recognise this. Well, the interesting thing is that the, uh, and again, this is just purely my interpretation, but the fact that Brody is wearing black he's now and he, we've stripped away those outer layers in terms of costume mm-hmm. he's getting back to what it might have been in the 70s to what is defined as masculinity and being a man but it also foreshadows the fact that he is death in some shape or form it's the death of the shark but also the death of the old brody yes. and there's going to be a rebirth and there's a new guy that's going to be going back to that island but because of this experience and it again it comes back to that key question that i think spielberg's films always kind of ask who do you want to be? Who, or, or more precisely, who are you really? And are you being that person? Yeah. And, and I, th- I, th- I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I thought I'd suggest that what Spielberg's really asking is what kind of man do you want to be? I don't think he's very interested in women becoming, um, discovering who they are. But he's, I think, mm. certainly in early films, he's particularly, I would say, before Jaws, that he made a TV film called Jewel, which yeah, Jewel, yeah, Jewel, yeah, I love Jewel. Jewel's amazing. And Jewel is film. just two blokes in vehicles. Right, mm-hmm. there's very little dialogue. We don't really know. It's not clear what they've got against each other. Mm. Um, it's very, very kind of economical, very, very beautifully done. Mm. I, I think Spielberg is interested in men becoming something. I don't think he's interested in women becoming anything at all. I think we're I just. Think, I think with that, I, I mean, again, yeah, I mean, he has done. What was the movie that he did when he had a female lead? There was one because someone called him out on it. And actually, then someone from the audience shouted out, going, no, actually, he did this. I will remember, viewers. I'll insert it later. Um, but I think the thing with with Spielberg particularly is off the back of things like, you know, the, the American political landscape and things yeah. like that, but also his own family history as yeah. well and, and, and all that. I think he's interested in just trying to let people know that it's OK to be who you are. I agree. That I think that's the thing, and I think he's probably better at maybe doing that for for men than, than yeah. women, particularly. Which makes, it makes sense. I mean, that's you know, yeah. he, you know, he's writing. Obviously, you have to draw on your own experiences. Mm. I think it would be very strange if he made a bunch of movies that were all about women. Um, yeah. It would be a very different film if the genders were, were flipped. Um, but I do well, think you, I, you I, know I, what? I, I mean, ten out of ten would watch, but I think it would be a very different film. Well, we've had this conversation with people before. It's like obviously the whole question about recasting or remaking Jaws in the modern day, you know, obviously it would be a CGI shark, which is absolute, you know, blasphemy as far as Jaws is concerned. Exactly, yeah. um, but, you know, if you were to recast it with a modern cast, who would you go? And then obviously I think we had um, the Ghostbusters remake, uh, the female led remake, mm. which actually I thought was pretty good. I yeah, didn't, I, I didn't think it, I, did, I didn't think it deserved all the hate that it got. I think no. it wasn't as good as the original, but it was very different to the original. They're trying to do something else, but then, you know, could you make a Jaws movie or a remake of Jaws? with an all-female cast or would it be gender fluid i mean i know we kind of segue in a way yeah. but the story potentially does yeah. it still work I, no i don't or think not? It would work. i don't know i don't think it would work because i think one of the, I, th- I think one of the things that that's happening in that film is is when we're seeing dysfunctional male society you put three women on a boat and say cooperate together to kill a shark they're like yeah sure no problem do you want to borrow my yeah. Women are good at that. Like we're good in a crisis. We're good at getting along with each other. We're good at forming teams. So mm. I think it'd be a very different film. But also broadly, I'm not really in favour of remaking films that are perfectly good. I can't see the point. I don't think it really does very much for for gender equality either. I kind of think so. So the discussion that that has that there's been recently about having a female bond. We don't need a female bond. We need our own stories. Like women deserve mm. our own stories with women at the centre. We don't want like a thing that men have been playing with for forty years. We want our own stuff. And I think I just find it quite patronising and quite like we're done with this. Would you like it? No, actually, I want my own thing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I was much more in favour of um. So for example, I would say rather than a female bond. I would say if you haven't seen it, Atomic Blonde is the way forward. I loved Atomic Blonde. I thought yeah, I've seen that. that. 
I thought she was terrific in that. And I was like, yeah, this is different. This isn't Bond. This is this is female spy, female led spy action thriller. I think it's brilliant. I would mm. much rather see twenty five of those than see someone try and twist Bond into something that involves women at the centre now. Like, I don't care about that. You've, you've had Bond. Like, do what you like with it. I don't care. We want our own thing. Mm. Um, I quite liked the female Ghostbusters. I thought it was fine. But I just, I, I, I really question the 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 idea that just taking a thing that, that has had men at the centre and putting women in it or putting gender fluid people in it does anything. I'm not sure yeah. it does very much. I think it annoys the fans. And mm. I think that's not really very useful. Um, and I think the other problem is that sometimes if you make a film like that and it's not very good, people just kind of go, there you go, you can't trust women with anything. Women have screwed up a thing. Women have ruined, yeah. our fav- women, women have ruined my precious film from my childhood. Yeah. And I think that's like, make, you know, do something new. Make your own thing. Do. I've just done a very quick search as well. And there were two movies that Steven Spielberg made that um, sort of put women at the sort of the forefront. The first one was Pre-Jaws, which was Sugarland Express, which yeah. was um, uh, Goldie Horn, which was 1973, 1974. Yeah. So the year before Jaws. Right. And then the other one was uh, The Colour Purple, uh, which was in 1985. So he has done female led or female character driven stuff. But yeah, the majority of his work is is about the, the, the guys. I think that makes sense. You know, if I was a filmmaker, I'd probably make films about women because I understand women better. You yeah, know, that, that, exactly. That kind of makes, I'm not knocking him for that, but I just think he's he's much more interested in the male experience, and that's fine. Mm. Like he's allowed to be to be interested. Yeah. In that. Okay, so who should we move on to next? Which should character would you like to discuss next? Yeah, Let's do Hooper. I Give us, Hooper. Tell us about Hooper. He's so interesting. So one of my thing, one of my favorite things about him in the book is that the affair that he has with Ellen, uh, he is absolutely passive throughout. Like she does all the work, all the emotional labor, all the admin. All the physical labor, it's all done by her. And a brilliant thing that I think uh, Benchley does is that he lets us see that almost in real time. So she kind of, she she tells a lie to her colleagues. She goes home, she changes her clothes, she calls him, she has a shower, she brushes her teeth, she does her hair, she puts food, she puts some um, change of clothes in her handbag. She even has the sense to notice what denominations of notes she takes out of the of the back of, mm. of, of the cash machine or whatever. I don't think that yes. happens. But whatever. She's like, I've got two twenties and a ten or whatever it is. Like she really thinks about it so hard. And then when they actually meet, you can be like, he's had a shave and changed his shirt. Like <laughs> he's just turned up. That's literally it. Like she's expecting so little from this man. Mm-hmm. Um and it's so there's this kind of it, she's kind of, I mean it's an obvious metaphor, but she's kind of playing him like a fish, right? She she does all the work, she reels him in. Um, and throughout their conversation in in this restaurant that they go to, she's kind of like, she's kind of flirting with him and hoping he's going to flirt back. And like she does all, she does everything. There's 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 a point where she goes, oh, it's going to happen. Amazing, we're going to have sex. Fantastic. By that point, she's done about eight hours of work. You know, that's why I say I think George is about exhaustion because she has to work so hard just to get this one man to have sex with her twice. You're like, oh my god, it's taken it's taken all day. Um, and I think in the film obviously that the affair is stripped out of the film that doesn't happen at all and ellen is literally like five lines and they're all about her kids and her husband um but i think what's so interesting about hooper is that when you don't when you take the affair away in a way he actually becomes a more interesting character because the way he Mm. behaves through that i mean it's not even accurate to call it an affair they have sex twice like um i think he actually is for me is a richer character in the film because you are then allowed, you're able then to focus on, okay, he's the rich kid, he's the scientist, he's the person who actually knows something about sharks. Um, and it 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 becomes a kind of cleaner story, if you like, because it's it's it there's you don't have that subplot kind of getting in the way yeah. of the actual story. I don't know how it would make the film like 10, 15 minutes longer and it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, the producers were very clear. It's like this is an A to Z adventure yeah. story, get rid yeah. of all of that crap and just yeah. 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 I mean, normally I wouldn't be in favour of that. Normally I would say, so Ursula Le Guin has the, the carrier bag theory of narrative, right? She says that there are two kinds of narrative. There is the the I killed a thing story, the, which, which she calls the direct masculine spear-based story, right? Fuck, I stuck it in the eye and it died. Hooray for me, I'm the hero. And she says there is the feminine nuanced story, which has detail and complexity. But I actually don't think that subplot really gives hooper depth and complexity it gives ellen depth and complexity mm. but it doesn't really give hooper anything because he's just a passenger he's just there like sure if you want like he doesn't he doesn't even consider that that's something that he maybe shouldn't do he just kind of mm. goes yeah sure you want to have sex great fantastic um it doesn't really add anything to him i wouldn't say mm. um 
so I think I'm quite glad it's not in the film because I don't think it really does anything. Um, yeah, but I, I think agree. I think the Hooper that we see in the film is this kind of almost puppyish character. He's sort of um, trying to bond with Quint and not, you know, sort of managing it, so trying to impress Quint, which he doesn't really do. Um, mm. And I think I think my favourite scene for him is when they um, uh, when they gut the dead shark and all the sort of junk on like the, the license plate and all that all that crap comes out of the shark. I love that scene. And one of my favourite things about it is that he, without I think meaning to do so, says what mm. I've just been saying about the semiotic rating of the shark. He says anything could be in there. You know, yes, exactly, it could mean anything. And what it apparently means is a license plate and a, I think a, I think a denim jacket and some tin cans. It was um, a ten, uh, fish head, tin can, yeah. and a uh, license plate. Yeah, yeah license plate. Right. Yeah. So I, I love that scene. And I think there's something, again, there's something slightly boyish about that. Let's just stick a knife in it and see what happens. Oh, okay. We'll <laughs> sure. Like, I, I don't think that's, there's something quite childish about that to me. Mm. That I, I quite I quite like it. I quite like that sort of um, almost teenage sense of, well, just sort of poke it with a sharp thing and, you know, that will give mm. us some information. Um, I think he's, I think I think he's he's slightly ill served in the film, just in the sense that he is really overshadowed by Robert Shaw. Um, I think all the scenes where the two of them are together, you're like, yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at him. I can't take my eyes off mm. that guy. Like, yeah. yeah, he's just such a fantastic actor that I think I think Richard Dreyfus slightly gets overshadowed for me. I think to be fair to Dreyfus, I think anybody with Robert Shaw in that character yeah. right? on that form, yeah. um, it, you know, is going to get overshadowed. Yeah, but absolutely. I think. The interesting thing for me is when I first watched Jaws when I was younger, I loved Hooper. He was my favorite character. I thought the other two were actually quite boring and <laughs> way, too, way, way too serious, way too serious. Yeah. Hooper is, you know, he's a he's not the comic relief, but he's definitely no. the most light, lighthearted. He's, and he's, likeable, he's likeable, isn't he? He's yeah, and he's very energetic and he is very childish in that way. And yeah. it's like, so yeah. that childish fascination with sharks, I think, is probably what a lot of people, yeah. um, particularly the youngsters, identify with. Because if, say, Hooper had been like Brody and Quint, they might yeah. not have actually been as fascinated or excited about sharks. So I think. I think yeah. in the long run, I think it was actually a very clever way of sort of just showing the two, not just um, attitudes towards sharks, but the two um, passions in that mm. way. And so you've got love yeah. and hate on, on either end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think with with Hooper, I mean, yeah, absolutely agree. I think that the, uh, the affair thing in the book, again, it, none of the characters are really that likable in, no. in the book, to be perfectly honest with you. Not. And when you're watching a movie, you really need someone likable. And the fact that we don't really... Not that we dislike Quinn at the beginning, but we misunderstand him. And yeah, then we, we get to know him at the end. Yeah. Hooper is kind of as it is, but you kind of get the feeling, particularly the the scene when he's on the boat, uh, on his boat with um, with Brody just before yeah. they discover Ben Gardner. That's when we get our insight into Hooper in terms of mm-hmm. his family life and his That's wealth it. and how yeah. he's basically paid for most of it himself mm. um, in terms of his equipment. And this is his choice, probably something that his family are against. And what when... Um, when Mayor Vaughan and Brody and Hooper are all arguing about, yeah. you know, what to do about the shark. Yeah. And they have this big bust up and Larry Vaughan turns around and says, yeah, he'd love to prove that, get your name into the National Geographic. Yeah. That's probably something that his family might have said because his family are so wealthy. It's like, yeah, okay, do do what you got to yeah. do to, Absolutely. you know, get yourself known and get that yeah. credibility and that reputation. Yeah. And that, that um, kind of theme of, of rich kids putting his own money into a, into his own passions, that's something you see throughout Binchley's other novels. So in, in, mm. In White Shark, for example, there's a very similar character to Brody, um, who has to Hooper. To, to, to Brody. Hooper, sorry, yes, to Hooper. yes, sorry, yes, you're right, to Hooper, who who has family money, if I can put it like that, and then uses it to found this kind of oceanographic um, research center. Mm. So I think I think Peter Benchley was really interested in that idea of what what do people who have money do with it if they yeah. don't want to, you know, be Rockefeller? What do they do with their money? And I think he's sort of interested in that idea of the kind of benevolent, uh, sort of independently wealthy person arriving from out of town, if you like, with this kind of. I always think I uh, think the thing with, with Hooper's boat is it's kind of like a spaceship. It's got that. It sort does, of, yeah, very you know Starship I mean? Enterprise, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very kind of, um, <clears throat> it's very film spaceship, if I can put it like that. Mm. It's not like a real spaceship. It's like a, a filmmaker's idea of what a spaceship would look like. I think. And I think that's super interesting in the context of other films that were being made in the 70s, like to have that kind of space spaceship and then to go, no, we're not using that one. We're using the one that looks like a picnic table that's going to yeah. be smashed into bits in 20 minutes time. I think that, yeah. I love that, that, that you see the fancy ship and then you're like, no, nope, we're not using that. No, nope, that's too easy. 
we're going to go and do it the old fashioned way. Um, I think that's much, I think I, I love that because you just think actually if, if they went out on Hooper's boat with Hooper as the captain, the whole dynamic between the three of them is destroyed. Quint totally. has to be, he has to be daddy bear, right? He has to be in charge. And mm -hmm. Hooper has to be baby bear and Brody has to be mummy bear who basically doesn't really know what they're doing and isn't comfortable at all. But that's the dynamic. It has to be those three roles. And if it's not those three roles, then everyone's very confused and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the ship, there's no way the shark could destroy that boat. There's no way. But you, you see the shark come up onto the transom of the orca and start smashing it to bits. And you're like, I absolutely believe the shark could, could smash that boat to bits. I absolutely believe that. If you see, if you were to see the shark try and attack Hooper's boat, you'd be like, well, it's just going to hurt It's it. not going to happen. It's not yeah, going exactly. to happen. It's not going to happen. But it's that... like a nautilus. It's going to be completely impregnable. But again, the, the, the vessels themselves, I guess, are a really good metaphor or indication yeah. in terms of the attitude. You know, Quint yeah. is holding on to the past as much as yeah. he possibly can, and he's living in it. You know, he wakes, and, and, he's, he's shackled with that guilt of what's happened. Yeah. And there's a, 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 an argument to say that has Quint manifested his own fate, yes. you know, by, by the way that by he's doing that? Because he yeah. could afford to buy a new boat, but he yeah. hasn't. You yeah. know, that's his yeah. lucky charm, there's his home, things, yeah. whatever it is. So, so there's two things there. First of all, his boat, his sorry, his home on land is very boat-like. Mm. Right? Wood panelling, all the, all the shark jaws everywhere, the kind of horrible pot of stuff bubbling away. Like, it's very, very boat-like. And I think the other thing to say is that um, I, do, I argue in the dissertation that Quint is, uh, that the shark that, sh that should have eaten him in the Pacific at the Indianapolis circles back to claim him later. Because he's he's he can't escape his destiny, right? He's clearly got yeah. a date with a shark at some point. That's it. Like yeah. that old story about death meeting the traveler in Aleppo. It's it's like I knew I was going to meet you at Amity. There we are, non done. Like there's yeah. there's no sense of him trying to escape that destiny, and there's no, no sense that that there's any other story to be told there. Like there's it's it's that, really clear. But that's the interesting thing. I mean with quint he's he's overridden by hatred or, or maybe even yeah. just guilt you know maybe he because he says in the but, movie yeah. i was most frightened when i was taken out of the water because yeah. he was at, he was at peace with the fact that he was probably going to die oh no i've got to live with the guilt which is worse but obviously hooper embraces the future he embraces new technology yeah. new methods new attitudes new things which is why he comes in as a very light-hearted happier character he takes the work seriously but he's obviously sort of coming from a very different place, but obviously he's also got that, that wealth behind him as well. But it yeah. really between the lines of some of the things that happen in the movie, he's walked away from that. He's distanced himself from that. He doesn't want he's to be a part of that. He wants to be his own yeah. person. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So what do we think? Obviously we, we understand Quint's journey. What do we think Hooper kind of takes away from his experience at Amity from a, say a masculine point of yeah, view? Yeah, I, I think, I think for Hooper, I, I, I think one of the things that, that we are being asked to maybe consider with Hooper is how I don't know how he would feel afterwards because he's just like everything else everything's happened without him he's missed all the action mm. um so he's been underwater while while Quint's been killed and he's been underwater while the shark's been killed mm. so all of that's happened without him and so to then I imagine that we're that we're supposed to think that they that they swim back to Amity and they're welcomed as heroes but Hooper hasn't really done anything it's not his fault mm. But he hasn't really done anything. And so I wonder, again, if you would have survivor's guilt then, you'd be like, well, Quint died and I was just kind of hiding in the shark cage, hoping not to get eaten. In the book, of course, he does get eaten. In the mm. book, the shark, I've got to say, in a, 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 the, one of the most overextended sexual metaphors I've ever read in my life, the shark bursts through the bars of the cage and eats him. And well, and, and grabs him, pulls him out and then pops out of the water and shows his body to the other two um and again to the bull, the bullfight metaphor it, it, it's like it's it's like the bull has got a horse on its horns and it's just mm. there like here you go i did it i killed a thing look at me and what happens is the two of them look at hooper's body and they're paralyzed mm. they can't they don't know what to do and eventually quint says oh god shit get the gun like come on quick and they just go up uh, and, and they they scramble for their weapons and they both shoot at the shark and they miss and then brody manages to shoot hooper in the neck <laughs> yes yes shark. he does and then the shark is like ha, 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 and that's it and then they and it says something i think ben she said something like and then they just turned around and went back to amity like completely defeated um so i think that in the book hooper's a a really interesting character from that point of view because that he's kind of young man puppyish enthusiasm and bravado gets him killed 
Mm. The other two say to him, don't go in the cage. You will get eaten. Like Quint says, if you go in the cage, you're going in the water and the shark's in the water. Like, I'm stating the obvious here. Are you absolutely sure you want to do this? And Brody sa- and it's Brody that eventually says, you know what? If he wants to get killed, I don't care. Mm. And, and he, one of the reasons he says that is he thinks, I'm pretty sure he's banged my wife. So actually, if he wants to go yeah. in the water, get eaten, I'm kind of fine with it. Um, but then when he actually is killed, they're both horrified. Yeah. So I think at the end of the film, I think Hooper's trajectory is so different. And I, I, it's really interesting to me that Spielberg doesn't really spend any time on that. That He just kind of pops up and says, is Quint okay? And Brody says, no, and off they go. There's no kind of, hooray, you feel the They're so tired. They can't but that's, do it. that's sort of classic, well, not just Spielberg, but George Lucas storytelling yeah. as well. It's like, it's like the, um, the bit where... And then's the end, um, it's the end, but there's no build up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the yeah, because Star Wars ends in a very similar way, doesn't it? Like yeah. when you've got Luke Skywalker going through the trench of the um of the Death Star in the yeah. X Wing, yeah. and you think, oh my god, he's just shot his last missiles. Oh my god, they're not going to make it. And all of a sudden, out of yeah. nowhere, out comes the Millennium Falcon. Hey, yeah. remember us? Bang! Yeah. Shoots out the the, the yeah, yeah, people yeah. that are trying to shoot that Luke, and then obviously Luke gets that little bit of moment, breathing space, shoots mm-hmm. the rockets, and in they go into the Death Star and detonates. And then literally, it's just a medal ceremony. See you later. Bye. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's basically and, it. And what I love about that is that in, bo- in both that film and, and in Jaws, the music is just like, the music's here to play us off. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Your Oscar speech has gone on too long. Battle, 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 battle. It's, like, it's, the, it's the end. I'm sorry, everyone. Mm-hmm. It's the end. We're done. This is how you know. Um, yeah. We couldn't be bothered to have any more story. Like, here's some music. There you go. We're done. Hooray, hooray. <laughs> there's no... But maybe that was, oh, but maybe that was the the attitude though, because obviously Spielberg and Lucas were good friends at the time. It's like oh. tell your story, get out. And that's yeah. all you got to do, even and you know, leave more. leave it on a high. And that's yeah. exactly which is why you know when they collaborate later on on things like you know Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's yeah. like you know the biggest movie event of the decade. You know, totally. I think it's so, also that, that that the kind of the the story is over. Like as soon as the shark is gone, the story stops. Like the shark's mm. gone, that's it. The main character is dead. There's, there's nothing more to say about it. Yeah, which is why for me the yeah I mean you wouldn't expect everybody to come back obviously obviously not Robert Shaw the ghost of Quint that's not going to happen mm. but um it I just wish that um we'd got to see a little bit more of Brody's character development and the after the psychological and emotional mm. aftermath of what happened before with him because obviously Absolutely. he doesn't really he doesn't actually battle the shark until the last five minutes of the movie he's no. kept on the land most of the time yeah. um and the Brody main and focus therapy, is what's happening yeah. to the teenagers yeah, yeah. with PTSD is a film I would watch. Like well, that's the th- well. This is the thing. It's like you know what you know. How does Brody correct the mistakes that maybe Quint made? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, Quint Brody's. Uh, 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 you know, I mean, you could argue this, I guess, but Brody's experience of the shark maybe isn't quite as traumatic as Quint because you know, obviously, Quint was in the water for a long time with those people with the, with those people watching his shipmates get killed, right. and also mm-hmm. preface that in the fact that it's happening during a, a world war. Mm-hmm. It's like this is terrible. Whereas obviously, Brody has had a very condensed, intensified version of that experience. But how does that still affect him as a man? You know, and yes. and that that was kind of just sidestepped. Yeah. Wasn't really interested in that think, particular yeah, version of the, the sequel. Think, as a man, but also as a husband and as a parent, you know, he's got to go home to yeah. Two boys. And I think yeah. it's, interesting, it's interesting that in Jaws two, his sons are, or what, I forget which son it is. I think it's Matthew. Is 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 very vulnerable. That it's his son that's the subject. Uh, there's Michael and Michael, Sean. Michael, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. This, this, it's his his sons are the kind of vulnerable people they're really centered i think in jaws mm. too particularly yeah. in the book which I, I have to say the book is terrible um but it's really clear in the book that that the boys are going to be the center of the story um mm. from, right from the get-go it's being flagged that they both want that they're both good swimmers they want to be divers and all that kind of stuff it's it's flagged up really early that this is now going to be kind of more personal i guess mm. um and that the boys are kind of at the center of that and, and that that story is really about parenting there's a there's a yeah. whole motif with a sea lion mother and her and her baby that runs through the whole through the whole story as well. well if, if you want to parenting, if you want a good read, read Jaws: The Revenge, the novelization, because there's a chapter in that that's actually from the shark's point of view. It's yes. incredible. Yeah, I love that um, shark's view stuff. I think absolutely it's fantastic. Um, okay, so let's talk about Brody. Obviously, I mean Ooh. he's he's the focus of the story. He's you know Spielberg's classic everyman character, sort of effectively representing us and our view of of, of the story um what do you when you sort of look at Brody's and this is I guess sort of focusing just on the first movie Mm. how do you kind of see Brody's sort of story from a masculine point of view progressing and evolving and what what are the key points that we should be looking out for I I think I think he's really interesting from a kind of masculinity point of view because he is immediately kind of outflanked by Hooper and Quint who are just who have kind of um claims to manliness that he just doesn't have 
Mm. And I think it's really interesting that he doesn't play the card of kind of like, look, I'm the only one of the three of you that's got a wife or that's got children. I've got two sons, which mm. in many ways in patriarchy is, is kind of the expectation, right? That you will that you will trap a woman into in the cage of matrimony and meet, and force her to have your children. And then mm. he's managed that and the other two haven't. And yet he doesn't play that card. He just kind of goes, oh, gosh, you've got boats and you've killed sharks and you used to be in the army and the war. Oh, you've been the Navy, sorry. And he just kind of, he, he, I think he doesn't really believe in his own claims to masculinity at the start of the film. Mm. And then I think as the film goes on, you see him, you see him, I think, initially as a parent. So I think where, I think when Alex Kintner's mother confronts him and says, you know, you made a decision that led to my son being killed, you see his guilt, but it's not just his guilt as a person, it's his guilt as a dad. Yeah, he, big he time. How devastating. Mm. that is um, and then again later in the later in the film where the shark is in the pond and and his wife says well michael's in the pond right mm -hmm. so again there's that the shark's back so we, with your policeman hat on you need to go and deal with that but also with your father hat on you need to go and deal with that mm -hmm. um, and that i love that moment when the shark is in the pond when you see it go sideways in slow motion underwater oh nightmare fuel nightmare fuel it's it's such a cracking shot um mm. and i think but but also um it, it's 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 amazing but i think it's also a gesture to um a a painting um which i imagine everyone is familiar with um I'm just trying to make sure i can find it so i can get the name absolutely right um watson and the shark Watson and the shark is the painting and yes it, and, yes, and yes, yes yes you see this this kind of this this shark sideways on um mm -hmm. underwater and i th i think it's a reference to that um I think particularly in the colour of the water. So in, in what's on the shot, the water is kind of green. And mm. in that shot, the water is kind of murky, sort of brownish green. I think that's part yeah. of it. Because the rest that's... of the film, it's relentlessly blue. Uh, yeah. It's, the colour palette for George is like that absolute seaside blue, bright yellow, bright red, white. Like it's painful to look at. It's so saturated. Mm. But that scene, the water is this kind of murky colour. Um, and I think I think the other thing to say about Brody is that he he's the kind of face of our anxiety in the film like that uh, that amazing dolly shot where you just go in on his like horrified face um mm. but also the all the moments where he reacts to the shark he's just kind of oh my god it's the shark um so he's sort of jumping for us mm. in that way so i think there are moments when we see him kind of reaching for masculinity and wanting to be respected by the other two but i think mm. we also see him just reacting really really honestly and really vulnerably um, to being in danger, to being frightened, to being mm. unprepared, to being on a boat in the sea, which he clearly hasn't really does not want to be there at all. And yeah. I think it's the only time we actually see him do anything that I think patriarchal masculinity would approve of is where he finally kills the shark. And the rest of the film, I think he's actually very likable and very vulnerable. Um, mm. And actually, in many ways, you know, trying to be a good dad, trying to be a good husband, really doing his best to do his job and taking that his sort of role as the provider very very seriously yeah um, and in the book when he figures out that ellen and hooper have been having an affair he just kind of says well i don't really care it doesn't matter to me like she's she's not going mm -hmm. anywhere it doesn't matter and he just forgives her and they never speak of it mm -hmm. i think the thing for me with with brody is that i think that because there's as you say there's about three or four different aspects of him there's mm -hmm. father policeman yes. um husband i think the thing with me, the challenge to his masculinity starts from the very beginning, very oh, yeah, beginning. Absolutely, absolutely. Like the the first scene we see him is as a husband, um, and you know Ellen is challenging him about feeding the dogs, mm. and you know their move from New York to to Amity. Obviously, I mean he's a guy that hates the water, but he's decided to leave New York for the for an island, <laughs> which mm. is interesting. Mm. So whose idea was that? Was it yeah. just a, a job in a quiet place? You know, sort of the last job he'll have before he retires. Yeah. Is that kind of what they want? Was yeah. it something that Ellen wanted? Was it, couldn't he couldn't he hack it in New York? Was it's there unclear, too think. much stuff going on? Yeah, it's exactly. Deli it's deliberately unclear as because again in the book it's yeah. much clearer, but I think in the film it's deliberately kind of murky as to like is is that a kind of vexed <laughs> question that they never really discussed properly? Is it just exactly. a bad decision? Was it one of them? you know sacrificing for the other it's really unclear and i think well, it, the shots of his uh, house i think make that clear as well like the, 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 when you see their house where they live you're like that's a house it looks like a shoebox yeah it's so kind it's, of strange looking i think uh, yeah i think um just start touching on the home thing as well obviously after um michael is attacked in the pond mm. and you know Brody says to ellen take him home and she goes yeah. home new york 
they're you're... not home here we're staying here we're going to solve this problem yeah. but like literally like at the beginning of the movie he's challenged about you know his his capability about being a domestic husband you know feed the dogs or whatever it is then his son comes in after playing on a swing that he told him not to play on so he's being challenged as a father then his authority is challenged as a policeman because he's got the mayor and the medical of uh medical uh examiner both changing the, the narrative of what's happened to chrissy watkins so he's like he's being challenged from all different directions and it's just like this 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 guy all he wants to do is just do a good job and he's duty bound and he's got a very what we appeared or what, what we assume to be quite a strong moral code you know and he's yeah. he's trying to live up to that but he's getting he's getting it in basically in all different directions which is why when you strip away husband when you strip away father when you strip away uniform and you strip away duty and all those kind of things ultimately you're just back to being martin brody on that yes. boat yes yeah and you do what needs to be and done when it. the moment comes yeah and, and, think, he, and he does yeah. it I think what's wonderful is you're right is that throughout the film, up until that moment, everyone just assumes they can push him around. They mm. they speak to him so rudely, like everyone's just kind of like you know, no, no one expects him to push back at any point. Mm. And I think we're supposed to perhaps think, well, the shark thinks the same way, right? The shark's just like, yo, you, well, now that Quint's out of the way, you're easy. Mm. Um, and I think it it is. There's a. I think one of the things that's really interesting about that those final scenes where the, where you see the shark kind of chewing on the on the, the super yeah, tank on the yeah on the tank uh i think it is antonia quirk who says that that's a reference to or she she says it reminds her of um clint eastwood chewing on a cigar yes um, and she says yes. it makes it suddenly makes it feel like a cowboy film and uh and then because it's finished with a gun right it's finished with an explosion it's finished with a, with a gunshot and mm. i think i think she's got i think she's got something there actually there is definitely something about that mm. sense of if you just get one thing right, right, you manage to actually shoot the thing correctly one time and it's all over. You mm -hmm. only had to do, really, you only had to do one thing correctly and you finally managed to, to get it done. Um, and and Roy Scheider's face at that moment is uh, just the joy of his face that he's finally done. I think it's not just the shark is gone. I think it's also, I have kind of proved myself. Yeah, I mean, and again, like when Hooper and Brody, we've actually also we've actually just um, published an article about is Jaws secretly a western because there's so much uh, western iconography in yeah, Jaws, absolutely. it's phenomenal. So you know yeah. the sunsets and all kinds sunsets. of stuff. So yeah. Um, we'll, yeah, yeah. So there is some definitely some western stuff going on there. But can you imagine when Hooper and Brody get back to shore, the bit that we don't see, and they go, "So what happened? Well, Quint died. The shark killed Quint. What? Yeah. Quint was sent out to kill the shark." Yeah. So Hooper, you must have killed it. Yeah. No, no, Brody yeah. did it. But Brody doesn't even like the water. Oh yeah, let him tell you the story. Yeah. But that's why all of a sudden, when in Jaws two, which I was kind of really hoping for, you've got this new because one of the reasons why um, Spielberg didn't uh, cast an A list uh, cast for those characters or very well known names is because I think Charlton Heston was sort of one of those that was going to yeah. be sort of potentially cast. Spielberg yeah. was like, well, you know that Charlton Heston's going to win. Yeah. He's gonna he's gonna kill the shark because he's Charlton Heston. So it kind yeah. of rob, robs the movie of a lot of suspense. Yeah. But it also is, because yeah. because Roy Scheider's um quite a slender guy, but he was very athletic, mm. he kind of had that physical vulnerability, but also yeah. the secret strength to get the job done. So you yeah. always knew that Brody might have been a wise bet, even if it would have been low odds. Um yeah. and ultimately, like like we said before, like with that whole family dynamic on the boat, whether it's the mum, the dad, bear, or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Brody's kind of taken that everything away from that experience brought it back to the island and has not necessarily become a transformative new man but he's learned a lot of very valuable lessons and yeah, that's I, why yeah. in jaws 2 why he just explodes on everybody at the committee because it's like you're about to let history repeat itself i can't let this happen again oh, okay yeah. great fire me although interestingly in a deleted scene the mayor is the only person that actually says no i wanted i don't want to fire him which is the mayor's redeeming moment which is actually edited out of the movie which is yeah. Ugh. Yeah. um yeah. So yeah, it's... I think you're right. I think you you said you think at the end of the film, well, he's not going to get pushed around anymore. Mm. Right? No one's going to be like, no one's going to be arguing with him about parking tickets or telling me he's nope. a bad parent or whatever. Like they're going to respect him because he's just blown up a shark. Yeah. <laughs> By well, he son. saved the town. He saved, saved the town, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. Wow, God, what an interesting character. This is the thing, like everyone says that Jaws is just this popcorn blockbuster and it's like, it's one of the greatest stories ever told when you look at it from a character perspective. And I think looking at it through, you know, framing it within the shark narrative that we now have a much better understanding of because there have been so many other shark movies since Jaws. But going back to Jaws and looking at it through that masculine character perspective and looking at each character's individual journey, 
there is yeah. so much there so much there inspired absolutely I think an, genius i think an important thing to say about that masculinity in jaws is that the shark is male and, mm. it, should, and it shouldn't be right the big the really big great whites are all female but they are very clear in the film and they're very clear in the book that it's a male shark um and in the film even hooper like the supposed shark expert doesn't say actually it's probably more likely to be a female guys like he doesn't say that at any point point. and in the book there's this amazing moment with a shark jumps out of the water and literally shows them its penis. In fact, sharks have two penises, as I'm sure you know. Mm. Yeah, and and Quint sure. says, I see your cock, you bastard. <laughs> My <laughs> favourite moment in the book. I just think it's so funny. Like, it's, not, it's not meant to be funny, but I find that really funny. Oh, because man. there's no reason for the shark to be male. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, yeah. And so that's why when Hooper then says, oh, but Hooper does all that, that, that does that kind of, that sort of long lecture mm. about, oh, the megalodon and giant sharks and blah, blah, blah. One mm. of the reasons he's saying that is that we've just seen a massive shark and it's a male and we know the females are like 25, 30 percent bigger. Yeah. But it's, it's really funny to me that, that the shark is male. Like there's, it shouldn't be. It makes no sense. And then, of course, in Jaws 2, they kind of correct that and go, oh, OK, well, now the shark is female and bonus, it's even bigger. Yeah. Um, and then I think, I think for me, that's where shark films start to kind of go wrong, if you like, because the, just making the shark bigger doesn't make it more frightening. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not really how it works. The shark being that's massive a... isn't the point. That's a very different take on the masculine conversation because size doesn't matter. Yes. <laughs> Although we are going to need a bigger boat. Hang on. Yeah. yeah. That, bigger the, isn't always better unless we're talking about better. boats. And yeah. bigger isn't always more frightening either. I think, you know, that I, I, yeah. I personally think The Meg is a pretty terrible film. And one of the reasons I think it's a terrible film is that the shark is just so big that you can't grasp it with your brain. Yeah. So it's like, he's, like he might as well be trying to blow up a mountain. But like Jason Statham might as well be trying to destroy Belgium like it doesn't make any sense it's so big like what's the difference between a, in terms of how difficult it is to kill there is no difference between a 60 foot shark and a 600 foot shark it just doesn't mm. make any sense um you can see the same thing in Jurassic Park where the dinosaurs just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger You're like that's fine I mm. get it but yeah. actually the little ones are the, 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 the little one the little velociraptors that can open doors are much more frightening. <clears throat> you don't need the massive t-rex you mm. need little, clever, scary, can work in a team. That's much more frightening. And I think you, you, I think filmmakers are now starting to understand that actually the fact that you can do CGI of a massive monster doesn't actually mm. necessarily make your film better. And I, th I think that's part of the reason why Jaws is very unlikely to be remade because that yes, story's sure, been told, so. it's been told so well. Yeah. And in terms of proportions the proportions are correct you know they've, they've kind of okay it's a big shark it's not a massive monster man with a shark like the meg or anything like that so go make your swim go go make your shark movies with other species in other mm -hmm. waters but in my opinion it's like leave jaws alone it, it alone. could it could be remade as an update purely from a technical exercise but in terms of the actual story and the impact i think that's about as good as it's going to get i just can't okay. imagine anyone else playing the roles the oh. writing is perfect Editing is amazing. The editing yeah. in Jaws is editing absolutely incredible. Is and the editor is a woman, can I say? The editor Yeah, yeah, Verna Oscar. Fields. And she Verna did Fields. win an Oscar. She yeah, absolutely deserved so. that as well. Just rightly incredible. So. But, yeah. but but sort of all driven with the vision of this crazy 26-year-old who wanted to go and film this movie out on the ocean. Yeah. Just to prove that, you know, studios could yeah. make some pretty good some pretty good movies if they invested themselves in, in it and, yeah, and come away with these incredible three stories. There's some wonderful oh, sorry, three characters. There's some wonderful stuff in Carl Gottlieb's book about Jaws where he basically says none of us realised that the ocean had currents or tides or waves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he just oh, keeps yeah. saying things like, we put the shark in the water and it floated away. And we were all like, oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that they're so surprised by like, these basic facts about water. I just find that so funny. The film kind of models what it describes in many mm. ways. Like, you know, it is clearly about men trying to live up to these ridiculous stereotypes. But I think also the and the more you read, the more I've read about the film itself and the making of the film, um, the more I kind of think, wow, you were so you were so trapped by exactly the things that the film is trying to show us. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of it when again when we look at the particularly Quint story, actually it's a very anti-masculine movie because it's actually yeah. Quint who it's actually Brody who arguably in this particular world the least equipped yes. to deal with this problem but actually yeah. ends up solving it because he just does what needs to be done and yeah. becomes who he needs to become so yeah, yeah he's able to improvise he's able to break out of that that cage of masculinity mm. like and go okay I'm just going to improvise with what I've got in front of me yeah that's yeah. it amazing
Jess, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Honestly, absolutely incredible to speak to you. One of the best conversations I've had. Oh, um, what we need to do is we need to get people to find you and follow you. So where can people find you and follow you on social? You can find me on Twitter at The Filthy Comma. Um, and you can also find me, uh, if you just search for The Filthy Comma, you'll find my blog as well. Um, that's probably the simplest. The simplest. Okay. Uh, we'll drop... I also do have a look at the, at the Haunted Shores, which is the online conference in April where I'll be speaking. What I'll do is we'll put some links into the description so people can find you uh, super easily. Um, it's normally tradition for me to leave the last word for the guests. So before I sign off, I'll say uh, farewell and adieu to everybody that's watched. I hope you enjoy it, this conversation. And uh, Jess, last word to you. Uh, everybody should go away. If you've watched this, everyone, please go away and look up Jens Bionebo's Norwegian novel, The Sharks. Please read it. It's wonderful. And I guess the other thing I would say is um, maybe consider watching um, some Cousteau and maybe even um, Blue Water, White Death, which I think is a really interesting pairing with Jaws and came out, I think, a couple of years beforehand and made yeah. by some of the same dive teams that provided some of the um, real shark footage for Jaws. It's, it's, it's really neglected, but I think it's, I think it's terrific. Wonderful. Jess, thank you so much. Guys, as always, farewell and adieu. Drink to your legs and we'll see you again soon. Ross out. Take care. <laughs> hey guys, thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to know more about Jaws, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and visit our website, thedailyjaws.com. Until next time, we drink to your legs. Farewell and adieu.